or okay. be back. Excellent. We're uh, being being uh, uh, innovative here, doing what we got to do. So, um, let's talk about the uh, the timeline. Um, this concept was introduced to this OCP community um, at a workshop in Dallas in September 25th. So there's several people out here that have perhaps seen this before, or maybe you've seen information on the, um, the mailing list. Um, we did follow that up, AT&T. We published uh, a draft specification that was sent out to the community in December of last year. And uh, it was really great. I got a lot of good feedback. Some of it was the way you would like to see it. It was through the mailing list. I know Veronica Phillips here from Molex got the Molex team engaged based on that. Uh, I reached out to some people in the industry that I knew and solicited commentary. And then another interesting thing really happened. Apparently, somebody wrote an article in one of the trade publications about this OCP spec, which created an email to AT&T, and I got to talk to somebody about this project that, that didn't know about it. So there's all kinds of interesting ways that this community can operate and that we can get input. And so with all that input that I received from all those various sources, we uh, revised the specification. There was, uh, again, a lot of good input, a lot of questions. Hey, how come this isn't in the uh, specification? Did you think about this? What about that? We, we had dialogues. I had sit-down meetings with uh, several folks, worked that out, revised the presentation. Or, I'm sorry, the specification, and got that out in April of this year. And um, also in April, we presented the, uh, the checklist the specification checklist to the incubation committee. So hopefully we will uh, keep pushing on the process. Uh, Tom and I were just talking about that earlier to uh, try to get this from a uh, draft specification to an approved specification. So let's talk about what this really is about. Um, a fiber distribution hub is used in passive optical networks. Uh, and it, it's maybe a little bit, it's a, probably a topic that maybe you wouldn't think of here because it's a totally passive device. There's no power, there's no software. Why would we talk about it in open compute? Well, let me talk about what the device does, where we are today, and where we hope to get, and I think that'll be clear. Uh, PON networks are point to multi-point networks. You have one port in the central office and you can serve multiple customers off of it. The way you do that is with an optical splitter. You literally just split the signal into many paths and send it to multiple customers. So we have to house that splitter somewhere. There's lots of ways to do that, but many operators, including AT&T, put a single splitter out in the network. And the way that that works is you run a fiber from the central office, the, the feeder fiber, into the neighborhood, and you terminate that fiber in the cabinet. Then on the other side, you run fiber optic cables through the neighborhood to get your connectivity to the customer. Those are the distribution fiber cables. So the PFP is where those come together, and it's a point where you can cross-connect from the F1 to the F2. But again, I said this is a point-to-multi-point -point network, so we need that optical splitter. So the PFP, or fiber distribution hub, also houses the splitters, and that's where, on a demand basis, you can make your cross-connects and bring a customer into service. So this is not a new concept. There are lots of products in the market available that do this, but they all have a little proprietary twist. And basically the way it works is if you buy a uh, cabinet from vendor X and you need to add some additional splitters as you grow, you have to buy that splitter from that supplier because just the unique form and fit and, and other reasons. So we just thought that doesn't really make a lot of sense. We wanted to apply some of this disaggregation uh, topics that you hear around software-defined networks and stuff to this very simple fiber optic device. And the way you would do that is with, with some form factors and stuff. So we wrote a specification that, that covers these cabinets. Um, and, and they come in different sizes. Now, in this specification, we only cover kind of a large, medium, and small size. There's some people that would say, hey, Earl, there's, there's, that's not enough. We need more. Well, I think small, medium, and large is a good start. You could do most everything you need with these three sizes. But the fact of the matter is, is we talk a little bit more about 
the proposed specification here, it would be very easy to modify this design, do a derivative work, and, and make a different size. I just didn't want to go in that much detail for starters. So we specified three sizes, uh, 864, 46, um, 432, and two, 288. And that's basically, when we say that, that's the number of customers that you can serve from this cabinet. And there's a chart there. I, I won't go into the detail, but this chart um, lays out the sizing dimensions for each one of those cabinets because there's, there's basically four major design criteria. Again, how many customers can you serve out of the box? How many fibers from the CO can you handle? How many splitters can you handle? And the interesting thing about these splitters is they already have connectors on them. We, we, we call them pigtails, but that way you don't have to run a jumper. The jumper's kind of already built in. Well, you, you can see in this one I have here, this could be quite a mess. So we have a way to park these terminations until we're ready to use it. Some people call that the parking lot, staging area. There's all kinds of names for it. But anyway, you have to specify how much of that you want. And then the other things that we specify is that we need a pad mount option, you know, just sits on a concrete pad for buried applications, or it can be pole mount. Or if you think about uh, a multi-dwelling apartment unit, it's nice to have a, a rack or wall mount version that you can use inside a building. I think the other thing I'll cover here is, um, this is just a block diagram showing what goes in the cabinet. So again, today, you have a proprietary design. Well, my thought was, why, why do that? Why not just have a 19-inch rack inside your cabinet? And then you can mount modules as you need them. Uh, it could be from the same people that makes the cabinet. It doesn't have to be. It provides flexibility. And, and there are panels out there. These are basically just termination panels with um, SC uh, APC connectors. So that, that's a very common thing that exists. It's out there. Let's take advantage of it. And the splitter modules, instead of going with these proprietary form factors, why don't we leverage um, a de facto standard? Uh, this is an LGX module. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. There's, there's nothing particularly special about it other than it's a de facto standard and lots of people build stuff to this form factor. The one I'm holding in my hand um, used to be a one by eight splitter, used to be a, a port here for the input and eight outputs. You might notice I uh, cut all that stuff out. There's a reason why I did that that I'll show you later. But, but the other point is there's it's easy to get. There's a lot of stuff uh, in this form factor, so let's leverage that. So the building blocks, let's just review that. The cabinet, it's kind of like the foundation if you think of a house, and how big a foundation you need depends on what size cabinet. Um, our specification refers to all kinds of general requirements. You might, it might not be a surprise to you that uh, although this is, you could say this is just bending sheet metal, we got to make sure we got the proper grounding. We don't want the thing to blow over in the wind, and of course it's got to be the right size uh, to fit. Uh, the uh, paint and everything needs to last a long time in a very uh, harsh outside plant environment. So we've got all the specifications, or, or we reference requirements in here that would give all the specifications to build that proper cabinet. And then the key thing is how much space needs to be in that cabinet. Well, so you kind of have to peel the onion back and, and take a look at the other building blocks to know how big the cabinet should be. So I talked about we need to terminate these F1 feeder fibers, the F2 fibers, and do this cross connect. So that's where these fiber panels come in place where we can terminate these panels or these fiber optic cables and these SCAPC connections. And again, I list a whole bunch of um, requirements that we want this to meet. But the good thing, the good story here about these panels is they already exist. Nobody has to go out and create these. Um, I happen to be showing an example of an existing product that Clearfield makes. Um, the reason why I, I mentioned that this is by Clearfield is I'm gonna tell you a little bit later that done a lot of work with Clearfield and they actually are building a uh, open fiber distribution hub that they're going to send to AT&T so we can do some evaluation. But 
If you spent some time on the internet or talking to your favorite uh, fiber connectivity supplier, you would find they probably have something very similar to this that would just as easily fit in this cabinet. The next building block, and this is where it really gets uh, critical from my perspective, you know, uh, my management team at AT&T, uh, we don't have any problems with the performance of the existing products. They work fine. Our only issue is this vendor lock-in that we've described. So th this is the key thing. How can we break that? Well, it, it, it goes back to leveraging this LGX form factor because you can see here on the top, you can buy any almost anywhere, <laughs> not at Walmart, but almost anywhere, you can buy a frame that will fit a 19-inch rails and will accept these LGX uh, modules. <clears throat> um, and, and the interesting thing also is, as I said, there's all kinds of split things that already exist. I don't have to have somebody go build an LGX form factor optical splitter for me. They're already out there in the market. Um, down here, I happen to show an example from Corning. Why did I pick Corning? Well, if you go to Google and type in PLC LGX splitter, this will be one of the first things that pop up on your search result. And if you go to it, you see a really nice specification sheet that shows you an LGX form factor, one by 32 splitter. It even has a nice mechanical drawing. Um, it would easily work. It, 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 I, I would prefer it to already have a F1 pigtail instead of having that uh, bulkhead. Where you, but you could run a jumper and it would conform with the specification. So really excited about the fact that there's a lot of existing product that, that already meets the specification. So. Before I go to the next slide, let, let me pause. I did mention earlier that I've been talking to the fiber uh, connectivity company, Clearfield, and we were sitting around talking about this spec, and actually Johnny Hill, the chief operating officer of um, Clearfield was there with me, he, goes, he just said, you know, Earl, I can build this. I can build exactly what you're specifying. I even have the parts. I just have to put them together. And I, I said, well, that's, that's awesome. I, I'd like for you to do that, but I said, I do have one question for you. When I look at your um, product portfolio, I don't see any LGX um, form factor splitters. I, I do see that you have stuff in a box design. This is not one of Clearfield's um, uh, splitters, by the way. This is just something, I told you you could buy stuff, this stuff almost anywhere. You can get it on eBay. That's where I got this one. But the point is, this is a very specific form factor. Um, it's 80 millimeters tall, 10 millimeters wide, 100 deep, um, and this is what Clearfield's um, splitters are based on. 3M also makes them. There's a lot of people that make them out there. And I said, so, so Johnny, I said, that's cool, but how does this splitter work with the LGX? And he goes, oh, it's easy. He goes, I'll build you a wrapper that goes around it and makes it, make it fit into the LGX form factor. So. Um, I've not seen the, the Clearfield design yet. I'm not sure what it looks like, but I imagine it looks something like this, and you just, like you said, slide this box splitter in a wrapper, and then you can stick this into an LGX form factor. So, you know, the, this is not particularly magic. I, I actually think it's better than magic. It's a um, very innovative and simple uh, design to create an elegant uh, solution to the problem I'm trying to solve, which is break this vendor lock-in. So just wanted to share that concept with everybody to illustrate that when you start with something like this and have uh, open design on your mind, there's a lot of creative ways you can get there. Hope we have questions and answers, questions later because we are, we're coming to the end here. I may not use up my whole time. So uh, you can't have a presentation without having next steps. What are we doing next? Well, I already mentioned to you that Clearfield is building a uh, fiber distribution hub that meets this uh, OCP specification. Uh, they're going to provide it to AT&T next month so we can do an evaluation. I guess I would almost call this a proof of concept test. Um, I will tell you that when I first floated this idea, I had people within my own company saying, hey Earl, I don't think this will work. Well, 
I think we're going to show them next month that it'll work. Uh, so I'm really excited about getting this in our facility so we can take a look at it. And the really great thing about what Clearfield is going to deliver to AT&T next month is with the exception of the cabinet, they did not have a cabinet with the 19 inch rails, so they had to make a modification in that regard. But everything else going in that cabinet is an existing Clearfield product. So the specification is being built on existing product. Um, and then the other thing that we hope to do, I, I don't have uh, commitments from other suppliers yet, but you heard in the talk earlier, I showed you various things that fit in this LGX form factor. Corning, you know, has a, a splitter module that fits this form factor. So my hope is to get some other suppliers to provide me splitter modules that meet the LGX form factor. Or heck, I, maybe they've got a box splitter that we can play with. But the goal is to get that stuff in the lab with the Clearfield uh, fiber distribution hub and demonstrate this interoperability because that, in fact, is really the goal that we're trying to achieve with this specification. So that is all I had for my presentation. I don't know if there's any questions, but if there are, I'll try to answer them. So the question is, what about power? So these, these devices are totally passive. They, they do not require power. Um, so that's what makes, that's one of the things that makes this design pretty simplistic is you don't have to worry about power and thermals, just, just solar load. There, you do have to worry about the fact that uh, during any given day, you might have a temperature range of 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the, inside that cabinet. I mean, these devices are not powered, but that temperature change can be, can be really tough on stuff like this. I'm told by people that are a lot smarter than me that the expansion rate of the silicon that makes up the fiber optic uh, pigtail is different than this material that surrounds it to create the protection. And there is a, a lot of... Uh, I, I don't know, I don't manufacture, I've never built, tried to build one of these, but I'm told by people that do that there's a lot of care that goes into the process, selecting the correct materials and making sure you follow certain procedures when you manufacture one of these to make sure that it will behave properly in those, in those temperature extremes. Now, one question somebody asked me at a previous workshop that's kind of related to your question is with 19 inch rails in there, well, could you put stuff in there that's that, that's powered? And the answer is, I would say maybe. And the reason why I say maybe is, I have no doubt you could physically make it fit in there and you could figure out a way to get the power to it. You just have to be concerned about uh, making sure you manage the thermals so that you don't overheat that equipment. And so it's interesting, you know, if, if we get where we want to be with the specification, have products out there in the community that conform to this, uh, somebody else could take that design and do a derivative work, maybe build a door, because one of the designs on this PFP, of course, is there's a door, so you can get in and do what you need to do. Uh, if somebody wanted to start putting active electronics in here, maybe somebody could do as a derivative work a door that has some kind of heat exchanger or fans in it. Um, I think there's a lot of things that could go, could, uh, Come a result from this if we get the um, get the um, critical mass going and get a lot of people interested in in supporting this ecosystem. Hi, I'm Chris I'm here at Bell I have a question about robbers and how they travel on this. I would call this the, the signal. Uh, Mr. Laurie, have you thought about um, ways that might leverage this kind of non-interlocking strategy for vector pulse? Yeah, so I'll just repeat the question. So the question is, well, Earl, this would be great if I was starting out new, but I already have <laughs> a lot of embedded uh, fiber distribution hubs. What, what can we do about that? And, and I agree with you, it's a huge, huge problem. Um, you know, there's tens of thousands of these in AT&T's network from different suppliers. Um, I have thought about that, and I, I don't have as good an answer as I would like because I, I think, unfortunately, there are some limitations to what, what we can do in that 
aspect. Um, uh, so, some of the existing product out there has a very specific form and fit that's protected by patents and um, you know the suppliers with the, that make it would tell you brings a lot of value but uh, I, I think doing um, what you suggested I've thought a lot about it and I haven't come up with a good answer yet um, if somebody out there has got a good answer I'm all ears and I, I'm sure you would be too Well, I, I th here's here's why the, the the premise of the question Wh whether so let, let's step back for a second. Obviously, we use these fiber distribution hubs or primary flexibility points whenever we the operators that use this type of architecture in their optical distribution network, whether it's a greenfield build or a brownfield, we build it this way. But but the question is, is around this. A lot of operators have been building these fiber to the premise networks for 10 or 15 years. So we've already bought the old style proprietary PFP, but we continue to grow um, in, in these, uh, uh, these uh, cabinets, I'm sorry. You know, uh, you, you hope to keep adding new customers over time. Or um, some companies will soon perhaps be um, transitioning from GPON to XGS PON. So there's a there's a interesting situation. You can, since XGS PON and GPON use different wavelengths, you actually can with a coexistence element in the central office. You can actually overlay XGS on top of GPON. But if you don't do that, then you need to establish new connectivity from the central office to each one of these PFPs uh, with a separate fiber to provide XGS. And then you got to stuff more splitters in that box to support your XGS, and you got to manage the fact that you got two different uh, types of splitters. Now, I'm not trying to make a case for doing coexistence, although I, I see some heads nodding that maybe you should do that. My, my point is we've got, unfortunately, we have lots of these cabinets out there that we're already living with with this vendor lock-in. And so a, a really good question is what can we do for the embedded base? Because this is more, to, to make this story work that I've just presented, it's a going forward, you, you know, what, what you might build next year or later this year, you could take advantage of this, but it doesn't help you much for the embedded base. Um, and I think the only answer I can provide is, yeah, I, 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 you're right, but I still would like to see this uh, project continue and hopefully maybe an offshoot of it is we do figure out a way to, to solve some solutions, solve some of these problems with the embedded cabinets. Great question, bad answer. Wish I had a good answer. Well, thanks for letting me hijack your. Uh, oh, oh. Uh, I have a question. Okay, Tom. <laughs> so I'm curious what other areas, or what's next, and what other areas could this apply to? Because in the back of my mind, I'm always tripping over the pedestal in my front yard. And um, I might have mowed over it once or twice, actually. <laughs> and then I worry about the th type of things that get put onto poles. And I wonder how often the pattern that you just unlocked happens in our industry. How many other places could we play this same game over again? Well, I, I, I think they're, they're, they're out there. And the opportunity that, and, and the challenge that was just mentioned is in the outside plant. You know, one thing I didn't mention before is when you build these fiber to the premise networks, we spend a lot of time talking about innovation that we can do on the electronics that we put on each end, but it's that fiber infrastructure that connects it is the most single most expensive part of building the network. So you only get one chance to do it right and well, in your lifetime almost, because we expect this stuff to last 20 and 30 years. So the answer to your question is yes, there are, there are opportunities out there. Um, I haven't thought too much about the pedestal that you talked. It's interesting, Tom, there are very <laughs> nice solutions for that today, mm -hmm. and they're all, as far as I know, highly, highly proprietary. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean they don't work. It just means that we, we've got the same same scenario here. Um, 
I've also thought about, you know, the, the coexistence element is something that I accidentally talked about by just mentioning XGS and GPON. Um, AT&T is, is looking at the possibility of doing that, and there's different options for how you could deploy that. And it, it's the same thing. It's, it's like these splitters. The, you got to put your optical components in something and provide uh, fiber connectivity. So I don't know. Maybe we should look at putting coexistence elements in here. Maybe we could add them to our PFPs. Um, I guarantee you probably almost every central office has a frame that would accept these. If they don't, you could add one very inexpensively because your other option is going to your fiber distribution frame manufacturer and have them build something in their very specific form and fit to go in there. It would work. It just means you only have one partner to talk to. Okay. Cool. <laughs> That's okay. I, I enticed them in by upgrading my speed, so. <laughs> All right, cool. Any other questions? If not, if not then thank you very much, Earl. Appreciate that. Thank you. That.